Hi guys, this is Dr. Marwa. Hope you're doing great. I was getting a lot of queries from my foreign medical graduate students regarding answers of internal medicine MCQs in the recently conducted exam. So well, here I am right before you and I'll be discussing answers to these questions in a very quick and a precise format. Some of the images which are present here may not be an exact replica of what came in the exam. It doesn't matter. I think the concept behind each of those four choices is what that actually matters. So let's get started. As I always say, knowledge is power. So let's knock some sense into this discussion. Starting with the very first question, he has talked about a 30-year-old chap with the valvular heart disease and is having fever for last two weeks. Now, please appreciate the fact that if you ever read the statement valvular heart disease fever, you are always going to think in terms of infective endocarditis. And then he has given some uh, examination findings in this patient, which you can notice are very characteristic rot spots. And then you can also notice Janeway lesions on the palms. Now, what is happening is that in the previous uh, FMG exam, they used to keep questions simple. They used to simply ask you about Duke's criteria. But here he's actually given you two images of the findings of infective endocarditis and then he has gone a step further what is asked you here is what will be the abdominal examination finding of this particular patient so you very well know the fact and i'll just show a snapshot from the medicine app you can see that in the fmg section in infective endocarditis component i've highlighted the fact that there would be vegetations or millions and trillions of bacteria growing on the surface of the well so all of these bacteria or a large number of these bacteria will be embolizing out of the heart towards the spleen and you would be having a splenic abscess and there you have it if you have a splenic abscess what will it cause a enlarged spleen in the patient and that will contribute to development of splenomegaly so please remember the answer to this question which is the infective endocarditis patient would be a simple abdominal examination finding and why this is happening is because millions and trillions of bacteria are being pumped by the heart into the systemic circulation so you would have a splenic abscess and there you have it a splenic abscess would contribute to a splenomegaly in the patient the answer to this question is option number C. Moving ahead, moving to the next question which was regarding a flatline ECG. A 70 year old man collapsed in his house was rushed to the hospital. We are having an ECG in which you can see an agonal rhythm. There can be few uh, QRS complexes but then it's actually a flat line and once you have a flat line we are basically talking about uh, asystole in a patient and the question was rather what will be the best intervention for this child. Now this can happen to anybody or this can happen in front of you at an international airport you know you're standing in the queue and an elderly gentleman in the flight collapses what would you do you would obviously give cpr but here he basically asked what is the basic management of this jab so you need to restart the heart you need to kick start the heart and what do you give to kick start the heart you give adrenaline so pretty straightforward the answer to this question is injection of adrenaline one milligram iv please remember defibrillation is contraindicated dc shock is contraindicated no we don't give a dc shock in flatline ecg though in television serials they show like this only no that they're giving dc shock in a flatline ecg but this life i mean actual life is not a television serial so even in gray's anatomy they will tell you that dc shock is being given to a person with flatline ecg because that's a television serial in actual reality we don't give dc shock in a flatline ecg you need to kick start the heart get the heart back to circulating uh, or do it, doing its job again so you need to uh, 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 stimulate the SA node and what's going to stimulate the SA node is adrenaline so you give a one milligram shot that would be diluted and along with that the CPR activity would anyway continue so answer to this question is adrenaline for flatline ECG and this is a snapshot from the app where I have shown or I have discussed regarding shockable and non-shockable rhythms. Emergency medicine, yeah, at least two lectures for FMG section I would like you to study. That is basic life support and advanced cardiac life support. And they teach you, uh, you know, back, uh, back at your medical college abroad, they teach you about basic life support and advanced cardiac life support. It's only that, you know, the, the instruction may not be that good. So I would just like you to spend some time and listen to BLS and ACLS protocol and you bang on spot for solving these straightforward questions and you can see a snapshot from the app where I have discussed regarding a flatline ECG. I have talked about adrenaline being given in a flatline ECG in a person that is asystole and then the function of adrenaline is to convert the flatline ECG into ventricular fibrillation. So answer to our question of flatline ECG is adrenaline. We move to the third one. This is a woman who is 60 years of age and she is presented with weakness in the right arm for 4 hours duration. The weakness has then gradually become lesser and she is a known case of hypertension so there is a risk factor no there is a risk factor hypertension can contribute to cns events hypertension can contribute to cardiac events because hypertension is a silent killer 
you can also see that the body mass index of this lady is elevated so there are two atherosclerotic risk factors in a lady who had a development of sudden onset weakness and then resolved on its own so this is definitely not stroke you see in stroke the symptoms are not gonna ever ever resolve so you can rule that out transverse myelitis how can you rule it out it's gonna present with paralysis of the legs that's gonna be paraplegia so it's definitely ruled out so you left it to either it's a compressive neuropathy you know sometimes you might sleep over your arm and when you sleep over your arm you might feel numbness in your arm but the point is when it comes to compressive neuropathy the moment the compressive neuropathy is relieved you usually tend to get improvement or at the same time i can put it like this somebody has a disc prolapse and then there could be numbness in the arm so obviously if a person is having pain or weakness in the arm i need to think of a local cause that could be disc prolapse but the way the question is given the straightforward answer to this question is tia a transient ischemic attack in fact here you can see image of uh, dhirubhai ambani with the the richest man in india with bill clinton and his two sons no mukesh and anil ambani dhirubhai ambani he died of stroke no he had one in 1986 he survived it due to good medical care and then in 2002 uh, he was maybe neglecting his health he unfortunately died because of stroke so as they say money cannot buy health but then transient ischemic attack is a precursor to development of stroke so the clinical history that came in the exam was basically in favor of a tia moving to the next question this talked about a 35 year old chap he is recently divorced there's a stress factor is suffering from palpitations headache and diaphoretic episodes on recurrent basis he is visited a psychiatrist multiple times now the bottom line is you can pick up here three things right that's the mnemonic that i've discussed in the app that is phd palpitations headache diaphoretic episodes they point towards possibility of a pheochromocytoma you see guys a lot of time and i've discussed this in the app section you can see that lots of time pheochromocytoma can mimic anxiety neurosis so a lot of these patients of pheochromocytoma may actually be on anti anxiety medications and they will not be having any improvement and that is what precisely the question was this was a chap who's definitely having a stress that's he got divorced re recently but then his symptoms are going beyond the standard anxiety component because he has visited a psychiatrist he has taken treatment but there is no improvement so in these circumstances what would you do for this chap you would straight away go in for checking out the catecholamine levels to rule out a pheochromocytoma in the patient you see the detailed examination of the detailed discussion of these mcqs would be in the main section in the app here i'm just trying to give you the answers so that at least you can calculate your final score so answer to this question would be based on pheochromocytoma which which is a great masquerader i mean this disease can mimic anxiety neurosis uh, i mean uh, it's it's uh, lots of time uh, even qualified doctors may make a mistake and may misdiagnose pheochromocytoma as anxiety and then suddenly boom you know this guy has a brain hemorrhage because of the hypertensive crisis so it's it's a nasty disease and should be picked up by checking for catecholamines in the urine or metanephrine in the urine moving to the next question uh, this was i think a straight forward one you can see uh, one doctor keeping a hand in the middle and another doctor uh, trying to check for the free fluid in the abdomen you see this patient is basically having ascites and what are we talking about here so you can easily rule out two options that is padel sign and hingorani sign because padel sign is for minimal ascites and hingorani sign is in obgy for a person having ovarian tumor so he left between a fluid trail and shifting dullness for shifting dullness you obviously need to shift the patient no? i mean you need to turn the patient to one side so here there is no turning of the patient so what are you checking for you checking for what i have highlighted in the app section you can see uh, here i am discussing massive ascites in massive ascites there will always be a fluid trail the abdominal veins of the or the superficial veins on the abdomen will be very much visible so the bottom line is that in massive ascites you can see the gross abdominal distension in this person would be having a fluid trail present and this this heralds a bad prognosis because this can contribute to abdominal compartment syndrome this image based question the answer is fluid trail moving to the next one i have kept a, a snapshot from the app so that you can basically go back to those lectures and listen to those parts i think that would make you feel more comfortable with why i'm saying that this is an answer to a particular question moving to the next one this is a elderly gentleman with hypertension so there was another one talking about a hypertensive chap the bp is fairly high we are talking about a possible hypertensive emergency yes this man fell in the bathroom which of the following statements is correct about this patient one is start antiplatelet drugs you see if somebody will fall down in the bathroom there is a high possibility of him having a brain hemorrhage and if a person is having a brain hemorrhage you will not give antiplatelet drugs why because they will worsen the bleeding platelets are given well platelets are not the treatment for brain hemorrhage no? 
reduce the BP to 120 or lesser. This is going to cause worsening of the patient. Why? Because uh, in this case, if you lower the BP to less than 120, the cerebral perfusion pressure will dramatically fall. That will cause a brain infarction. That will contribute to rather killing this person. First, he presented with brain hemorrhage and you are causing a brain infarction. The guy will deteriorate. So what are you going to do? You are definitely going to treat this person's raise ICT by using a ventriculostomy. You might have to go in for a decompressive hemicraniectomy. So definitely you can rule out the three options. And the correct answer is Putamen is the most common site. I have highlighted this in the app. You can see here when I'm discussing a hypertension topic in FMG section of the app, you can notice the fact that in hypertension part, uh, the bleed occurs in the Putamen. So that's where the mortality component comes in because Putamen would be adjacent to the lack lateral ventricle or the third ventricle and therefore once the bleed will expand it will press on the ventricles it will cause a raised ICT in the person it will cause posturing in the patient decorticate decerebrate and then well you have a coma and the person dies so brain hemorrhage causes posturing and finally a mortality the next one was slightly a difficult one this talked about a 70 year old man with recurrent episodes of exertional syncope one, the moment you read about an old man and you think that there is a chest pain occurring, you have to think in terms of uh, possible blockages in the coronary artery of the person. But people who are having blockages in the coronary artery, they usually present to you not with exertional syncope. They usually present to you with chest pain. But in this guy, there are two things given. There's a chest pain, there's an exertional syncope. So what you should keep in your mind is also a valvular lesion. In fact, in geriatric age group, the commonest valvular lesion is iotextanosis. Now, he has himself told you that this is a case of valvular aortic stenosis and is giving you a radiological finding of this person. So, the bottom line is, guys, he is asking you what would you get in a person having valvular aortic stenosis. The first thought process of mine would be aortic stenosis will cause enlargement of the heart. There would be left ventricular hypertrophy. And if you look at this x-ray and then if you look at the options, there was no left ventricular hypertrophy asked. So, let's solve it. Option A says dilated aortic root. Now, this is what you read with aortic regurgitation. You know, dilated aortic root will cause blood to leak back in the heart aortic regurgitation. Widening of the aortic knob. This is again a feature. Both A and B are related to each other in a sense that if you are having widening of the aortic knob only then you would be having aortic regurgitation. You are left between C and D. That is a widening of the vascular pedicle and the post dilatation of the aorta. Now, widening of the vascular pedicle is a feature that you encounter with patients having cardiac tamponade. There is a separate MCQ in cardiac tamponade in the subsequent part of the discussion. You can keep listening to that. The bottom line is in aortic stenosis patients, in a lateral view as well as an AP view, even if you don't know how to read x-ray, it doesn't matter. If there is a stenotic lesion, there would be some dilatation also. No, Wherever there is a narrowing, there can be dilatation also. So this is a post-stenotic dilatation of the aorta. And if you look at this x-ray, I'll just come back to the previous image. The bottom line is, you see, the right heart border. I've always emphasized this. Right heart border is composed of a right atria, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. You can see in the snapshot in the app, describing the heart borders. And in this x-ray, this was slightly a difficult one, very frankly speaking. But you can definitely notice that there is a bulge. And I'll come back to the original image. You can see that there is definitely, a, a, I would say, a prominence in this part, which is above the standard location. This bulge which is present is the dilatation of the aorta right after the stenotic valve. So this is where the stenotic valve would be somewhere. This is going to be the left ventricle which is going to be ejecting blood into the aorta. So since the aortic orifice is narrowed in this case, you are having a post stenotic dilatation. So the answer to this one would be alpha choice number D. Uh, these are the snapshots of the heart borders. Please go through that in the app section, valvular lesions. And uh, even if you don't go through valvular lesions, go through the murmurs part. That would give you a definitive insight. Moving to the next one, he talks about the elderly chronic alcoholic patient. Now alcoholics, uh, whenever he gives you alcoholic patient, what is he going to ask you? Is either going to ask you cardiac issues, very, very wet, very, very CNS issues, Wernicke's encephalopathy, corsic of psychosis, or delirium tremors, or is going to talk about nutritional deficiencies. So, the moment I read this question, my thought process should be crystal clear. Either it's a cardiac issue, is it a CNS issue, is it a nutritional issue? And look at the findings. He's talking about bleeding gums. He's talking about petechia in a patient. So, you know the fact that all clotting factors are produced in the liver because all clotting factors are produced in the liver. Therefore, uh, bleeding can occur like this. But when you look at the options, you can notice the fact that there is no mention of standard prothrombin time. You know, normally when we discuss liver, we always study prothrombin time is always elevated in chronic liver disease. So in this question, if you look at the options, I'm ruling out option B, factor 8 essay because that is for hemophilia. No? 
factor 8 assay is ruled out because it is for hemophilia rbc transcriptolase activity is useful for identification of wet beriberi or thiamine deficiency and this chap is not having bleeding gums due to thiamine deficiency so two options are ruled out you left with two thrombin time plasma ascorbate levels the bottom line is guys nutritional deficiencies of vitamin c can definitely occur in alcoholics because we have thiamine deficiency they could be cardiac lesions cns lesions if it's a vitamin c deficiency it can contribute to manifestations like these so what are you gonna do you gonna take the blood sample spin it and then you can take the square foot levels so the answer to this would be plasma scarbet levels. The bottom line is you can have nutritional deficiencies in alcoholic patient. And instead of asking about thiamine, which he has asked so many times, he has this time decided to ask regarding vitamin C deficiency. Moving to the next one, he talks about, this was slightly a difficult one. I think the surgeon will also talk about it, but let me do my part. He talks about a patient with palpitations. Okay, the heart rate is on the higher side. Respiratory rate is fine. So there's definitely some evidence of sympathomimetic stimulation given in the question. Now, what are the conditions that you know about sympathomimetic stimulation? Pheochromocytoma, it could be thyrotoxicosis, and he tells you that his mother has recently expired due to renal cell cancer. Now, the moment you read this word, his mother has died because of renal cell cancer. All of you are aware of the fact that renal cell cancer is related to one Heppel Landau syndrome. No? Van Heppel Landau syndrome is the one related to chromosome 3, and this can have a genetic basis. So, the bottom line is that in this person, there is a possibility of a familial uh, tendency for cancers. You see the mother has died because of renal cell cancer and the son of this person, the daughter of this person is presented with features of sympathomimetic stimulation. So, well, this is slightly a difficult one. Where did I discuss this in the app? I discussed this in the integrated session. You see, right before the exam, we came out with integrated session between me and Dr. Spursh. And you can see here, me and Dr. Spursh, when we have discussed pheochromocytoma, you can see all the syndromes that we have discussed, men, type 2a type 2b and von hippel landau and von hippel landau syndrome is one which is associated with renal cell carcinoma as well as pheochromocytoma so because the mother has died because of renal cell cancer well i need to evaluate the son for possibility of pheochromocytoma so well what is the test for pheochromocytoma so it's a two-step question i rather i'll put it three steps first you need to know the syndrome vhl Two, you need to know what is present here. Two things, PO as well as renal cell cancer and can occur in different generations. And now you need to solve how do you identify a pheochromocytoma. So what is the best test, guys? No, it is not catecholamines. It is a rather end products of catecholamine metabolism. It is not vanyl mandelic acid. I mean, a lot of chaps answer vanyl mandelic acid. Guys, I have explained this so many times. Vanyl mandelic acid is not to be answered for pheochromocytoma. Don't fall in that blunder that your seniors have also done. Vanyl mandelic acid is for neuroblastoma, man. The correct answer for this one is delta. That is going to be a fractionated metanephrin levels. Go to the pheochromocytoma section. Listen to it. Listen to it at 2x. And I'm, I, I am telling you why. Because pheochromocytoma is going to stay with you for rest of your life. Any entrance exam you're giving. You're sitting for FMG. You're sitting for PG entrance exam. you sit for USMLE. Any exam you sit, pheo is always asked. So please listen to that at 2x today. Just do justice to your time. Just spend few minutes and I'm very sure that this this read, listening to this data for pheochromocytoma would be very, very useful. And I agree that this was a difficult question. And uh, we have uh, discussed this in the integrated session. You can see uh, renal cell carcinoma and VHL being discussed. Moving on. Uh, comment on the serological report of this hepatitis B positive patient. You see, the problem is that most of us know how to diagnose acute hepatitis and chronic hepatitis B. And in acute and chronic hepatitis B, hepatitis B surface antigen is positive. The key in this question was hepatitis B surface antigen is negative now because you see in both acute and chronic hepatitis B, surface antigen is always positive. So you can easily rule out the options. Guys, I'll repeat that again. Surface antigen positivity is found in acute hepatitis B. Highly infectious patient, lowly infectious patient, sabhi mein positive hota hai. Chronic hepatitis B mein bhi surface antigen positive hota hai. To iska answer ABC to ho nahi nahi tha. You know, lot of guys got confused. Kyunki sir, wo kare ki ji, is mein security system, which is the security system, antibody is the surface antigen. And IgG antibody core antigen positive. So people were thinking chronic hepatitis B. But the bottom line is that there are two things positive in this guy. That is the security system antibody to surface antigen IgG class of antibody. This is not acute hepatitis B. This is not chronic hepatitis B. This indicates a previous infection. The surface antigen has been cleared off. The correct answer to this is delta. If you go through the treasures of prep ladder, you see, I would suggest you 
uh, if you are a, for a medical graduate student and you are preparing for your December exam, uh, the tre treasures part in our app, I would like you to go through them and this is the table. And for interpretation of this table, you know, what you guys are going to say, sir, itna bada table kon padega? So, I have explanation to you. You can see in the hepatitis B. I have explained acute, kya hota hai, chronic, kya hota hai, recovery phase. Kya hota hai. I have discussed those aspects. So, all you need to do is, if you get this table right now, you have to work out exclusion because you see, he is trying to see your exclusion skills. The bottom line is fast reading of the question. If you do a fast reading, in the first go, guys, your eyes have to be on the screen for all that duration. It's all about mental toughness. It is all about mental strength. I mean, if you can focus on the screen for that long, I can assure you the fact that you can come out with anything, guys. I mean, anybody who can go through a screening exam, you can clear any exam in the world. I mean, you should be proud of it, no? I mean, he's giving a difficult exam. Yes, man, I, can, I, I cleared it right in the first go. That's the attitude that I want you to have. Now, for this question, guys, I'm going to get... Uh, lot of uh, queries and uh, I would have students saying ki sir ye image nahi tha I agree sir koi baat nahi image nahi tha but still there are four options na those options are clear rheumatoid arthritis psoriatic osteoarthritis scleroderma your objective should be that you should know how to differentiate between them because exam mein nahi kar pahe na lot of you were not able to do it so let's solve this I have this guy with me who told me that this was regarding a female patient there's pain in the joints there's a rash on the dorsum of the hand yeah a bit of redness in the joints can be noticed and uh, there is extensive skin induration and skin tightening now he said what is the diagnosis now rheumatoid arthritis per se guys in rheumatoid arthritis whenever he will give you an image based mcq you would be definitely able to see rheumatoid nodules were there rheumatoid nodules in the exam most people said no sir there were no rheumatoid nodules and you can see you know this is a particular deformities in the hand you can see you can see in fact uh, i'll just show you another image so that you can be more comfortable if you go through the app section i have discussed regarding swan neck deformity you compare the swan neck deformity with the boutonniere's deformity versus mallet finger they might look the same so you 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 should have the capacity to differentiate no i mean this is easy swan neck deformity Nobody is going to mess around, but then boutonniere's deformity, definitely there can be issues. And boutonniere's deformity versus one neck can be confused very much with mallet finger. Mallet finger is what Dhoni developed once when, you know, wicket keepers or footballers are the ones who develop it. So, well, I don't think so that uh, if they give you an image like this, you should ever mess up and, and the advantage, you can still see a rheumatoid nodule. So, was there a rheumatoid nodule present? Most people said, no, sir, we could not see any nodule. So, I'm rooting that out. Psoriatic arthritis can be a possibility because psoriatic arthritis will cause involvement of DIP and then you would be seeing pitting of the nails. So I'll show you an image now of a person having psoriatic arthritis where you can notice, I'll just zoom it in, you can notice the pitting of the nails, no? So if you're having a pitting, you are having a bit of rash because psoriasis will also be having a rash and you can have deformities in the distal interphalangeal joint. Yes, it can be psoriatic arthritis also. But coming back to the original discussion, in the actual question that came, it mentioned a young female. So, you're ruling out osteoarthritis because osteoarthritis occurs in old age. You're ruling out rheumatoid arthritis because there are no rheumatoid nodules, no swan neck, no boutonniere's deformity. I'm open to discussion on this one. Then is psoriatic arthritis where I just showed you an image. There should be psoriatic lesion. There should be pitting of the nails. None present. The key word in this MCQ, which I think a lot of you missed, was extensive skin induration and skin tightening. And that's a very characteristic feature of scleroderma. Because in these patients, there's going to be a fibrosis below the skin. So, there would be a contracture and that contracture will contribute to manifestations of scleroderma in the patient. So, well, you would do investigations, no? For scleroderma, we do a topoisomerase antibody, we do anti-centromere antibody. That, those are subsequent things. But uh, obviously, this question is subject to debate. I agree to that. And uh, I, I personally feel that if it's extensive skin induration present with skin tightening, then this should be the answer that should be given. Moving to the next one, he talks about a 40-year-old chap who comes to the OPD with excessive sleepiness and lethargy. On physical examination, clinical features which are shown here are depicted. There is no free foot in the abdomen and liver or spleen are not palpable. Now, when I read this, you know, the first time most guys say, sir, I mean, it's not a big MCQ with four lines. You know, it takes the mental balance off. No, guys, you need to keep the focus on. So, let's do a quick read again. A 40-year-old chap has come with excessive sleepiness and lethargy. So, there is definitely something related to his sensorium. So, is it a CNS question? Unlikely because he is showing jaundice. The moment I read and I correlate a person having jaundice and sleepiness 
he could be having a hepatic encephalopathy. So the moment you read the first line of the question and you cast a glance at the image, it gives you an idea. Something related to liver is there. And at the same time, he mentioned regarding alcohol consumption in a person right in the end. So there you join the dots. A alcoholic chap feeling lethargic for most part of the day because he has damaged his liver. He is having jaundice because his uh, liver damage has decompensated. So what is the presentation guys? It's a decompensated jaundice. It is a decompensated alcoholic cirrhosis. And what is the second image showing? You can notice, uh, in fact, I've, I have highlighted this in the app. You can see through the discussion. I've highlighted there is clubbing and that's the image. No, that's the clubbing manifestation. You can see the parrot beak appearance of the nails which is present. And at the same time, you can also notice a very particular contracture in the ring finger. This contracture in the ring finger is called as Dupuytren's contracture. You can see that I've discussed these manifestations of cirrhosis in the liver component. So you get compensated cirrhosis, you get decompensated cirrhosis. But the moment jaundice starts coming, the moment you start having varices, you start having caput medusae, it means that the person has gone into decompensation. So this is a straightforward case of alcoholic cirrhosis. For the remaining options, I'll be discussing in the main app a more detailed discussion of this question. Moving to the next one. This lady has presented with complaints of palpitations and weight loss. On examination, there's a sinus tachycardia. The moment you read about palpitations, weight loss, sinus tachycardia, you know that either this is pheochromocytoma or it is thyrotoxicosis. These are the only two things that which, can, which, which have to be put in differential diagnosis. Both of them can be having these manifest. Now, pheochromocytoma has already come two times in your exam. Two questions we have already solved. Unlikely, the third one will also be pheochromocytoma. And then he's giving a skin lesion. No? On the shin of the person, what is the lesion, man? You can see in the rapid revision part, I have highlighted lesions on the shin. In fact, if you just go through this one slide of RR, I can assure you the fact that in the GI section, two questions can be solved here. One question will come later. This is the exact or possible image that came of a lesion on the shin of an ulcerative colitis patient that would be a lesion by the name of pyoderma gangrenosum. In the same slide, I have also discussed another lesion on the shin of a diabetic patient. This is necrobiosis lipidoica diabeticorum. Now that's a longish name. I mean, if you read it for the first time, it will obviously give you jitters. I know that. But necrobiosis lipidoica diabeticorum, that's that seen in shin of a diabetic patient. And in thyroid disease patient, you can see in Graves disease patient, you could be having is an orange discoloration of the skin that is pretty maxedema. So the snapshot is from rapid revision here. And uh, you can see that's the lesion that he gave you. The correct answer to this question is beta hyperthyroidism and even if you don't focus on the image, the clinical features are in favor of hyperthyroidism only. The answer to this question is beta. Moving to the next one. This is post-op day 2, so the surgeon will discuss it. Let me do my part. Our routine x-ray was performed. Now the patient is not complaining of any respiratory distress, is comfortable, bilateral, ear, bilateral equal air entry is heard. You see, lots of time, you might be in a post-op round, you are finding the patient is very, very comfortable. But uh, auscultation findings are also coming out to be normal. But the x-ray is showing a nasty finding. You can see a black area where there are no vascular shadows. So this guy is definitely having a small pneumothorax. Now, why did he have a small pneumothorax? That could be a complication. That could be occurring uh, because of maybe anesthesia-related complications when he was being ventilated artificially following a general anesthesia. So, if a person is having a small pneumothorax and there is no distress, what would you do? You would just monitor the patient. So, the correct answer would be a wait and watch and a supplemental option. Why would you not put a wide bore needle? Why would you not put in a chest tube? I have explained this in the section in the app. You can see I have described that if it is less than 25% lung collapse, you would just give supplemental oxygen. If it's a 25 to 50% collapse, needle aspiration. And if it's a 50% or more, then you would obviously go in for or central sinusitis, either of the two. Then you will straight away go in for a chest tube. You would be putting an intercostal drainage tube in the patient. That is a, a chest tube that would be put in the fifth intercostal space in the anterior axillary or mid axillary line in the triangle of safety. So for pneumothorax, guys, we are talking about a person having spontaneous pneumothorax. Spontaneous pneumothorax, the management depends upon the percentage of lung collapse. If it's a small pneumothorax not causing significant manifestations in a person, it is supplemental treatment only. But yes, if the same person is deteriorating, the pneumothorax component has increased in size, the sinuses, you will have to put in a chest tube. Answer to this question is alpha. We move to the next one. 
This person is having chest pain at rest for last six hours. ECG was performed and is showing features of myocardial ischemia. I think this was one of the easiest ones. Even the pathologist would have discussed it. I mean, guy with chest pain for six hours, myocardial ischemia, biomarkers are showing these derangements. So we are definitely discussing a MIE and you very well know the fact that myocyte necrosis will cause LDH1 values to increase. So I think this was a relatively easy one and even the pathologist would talk about this one. Moving to the next one, a 50 year old man, he presents with recurrent episodes of chest pain on exercise. Now the moment you read chest pain on exercise that you have to think in terms of chronic stable angina. On routine BP monitoring, his blood pressure is found to be elevated, so the risk factor is hypertension. So he's basically combined the two. What is the best drug for management of this chap? That is a chap with hypertension with chronic stable angina. You see, I've highlighted in the app section that for any patient with chronic stable angina with hypertension, the drug of choice is beta blockers. In earlier times in the exam, they simply used to ask, what is the drug of choice for chronic stable angina? And this time, instead of asking you drug of choice, they rather give you a clinical history of a chap with chronic stable angina with a risk factor of hypertension and if you combine the two the bottom line is guys if a chap is having chronic stable angina hypertension it's always going to be beta blockers in fact a uh, pharmacologist has discussed one mcq and congestive heart failure also so i just want to highlight the fact that when you are having a combination of in fact i'll write it like this listen to my words very carefully even if you are of come here just by chance listening to this video i want you to pay attention in a patient of chronic stable angina with hypertension in a congestive heart failure patient with hypertension, in both of the scenarios, the mortality reducing drug that you would be using would be as follows. If he specifically talks about which drug will reduce mortality in chronic stable angina, your primary answer is beta blockers, that is metoprolol. And if he talks about which drug will significantly reduce mortality in congestive heart failure patient, then please appreciate that in congestive heart failure patient, if it is heart failure with Preserved ejection fraction. Go through the CHF lecture and I've talked about aldosterone antagonist and ARNI. ARNI would be aldosterone receptor antagonist and then would be nephrolysin inhibitors. So please go through these segments in the relevant part of the app and I'm sure you would be getting a lot of questions on this topic even in your future exams. AA stands for aldosterone antagonist like spironolactone or epilirinol. Moving on. Coming to the next question, he talks about a 30 year old man with complaints of fever and breathlessness for three days. On examination, the right mammary area, bronchial breathing is heard with normal air entry bilaterally. Please appreciate the fact that in pneumonia patient, air entry is normal. I mean, a lot of guys were saying, sir, answer cannot be pneumonia because air entry is normal. My point is, guys, pneumonia has a normal air entry. You see, pneumonia basically means pus in the airways. So, pus is rather in the alveoli. Pneumonia has passed in the alveoli, so air can still enter into the airway. So air entry is normal, it is bronchial breathing, which is auscultatory finding on pneumonia. Well, this patient's question has been asked earlier also. You can see a very classical sillhout sign, no? The cardiac border, the heart is also wide, lung is also wide. So this is definitely a right middle lobe pneumonia. We'll do a more detailed discussion of ruling out other options in the main section of the app. But please go through this MCQ. There are two differentials of this. One could be hydropneumothorax. And most people were confused of hydropneumothorax because this was relatively a straight line. But why is it not a hydropneumothorax? Because if it's a concomitant hydropneumothorax, there should be blunting of the CP angle. No, here CP angle can definitely be seen. There is no blunting of the CP angle on either sides. Whereas when it comes to hydropneumothorax, you would have blunting of the CP angle. So because in this question, one, hydropneumothorax auscultatory findings would be different from one given in the question. The auscultatory findings are telling you it is pneumonia. Even if you don't know the auscultatory findings, okay. If you look at this x-ray, you cannot answer it a hydropneumothorax because water, when it will go down, air will rise. The water, when it will go down, it will cause blunting of the CP angle. Man, the, the CP angle will be obliterated. There would be complete wideness. But in this case, CP angle is still visualized. But this definitely indicates a right middle lobe pneumonia in the person. The next question talks about uh, impression from a chest x-ray. So students told me that they could see an image of a device. From this device, you can see wires. I'll, I'll just trace out the wires. One is going to the atria. okay, And the second wire is uh, going into the ventricles of the patient. So there are two wires from an electronic device. So what is it doing? It is controlling the heart rate. So what is it? It is the pacemaker, right? 
so this is a pacemaker it could be a icd that is a implantable cardioverter defibrillator but the bottom line is this device which would be deployed in the left side of the chest where there would be a visible scar in the chest of the person is mainly for treatment of bradyarrhythmias moving to the next question he talks about prophylactic cns radiation is given for which of the following cancers now this question is slightly a difficult one this is from the exam section part where i've discussed the exact question i agree this is a difficult one you see guys prophylactic cranio radiation is given two times one is in children and second time in adults and when do you give prophylactic cranio radiation in children for blood cancer alm acute lymphoblastic leukemia has tendency to go to the brain it shows micro it shows metastasis it shows cns leukemia so to treat the cns leukemia component you need to give radiation so remember if this question is repeated again and he gives you a pediatric case where you need to go in for prophylactic cns radiation you do it for blood cancer but in case in case it's gonna be adult then it is small cell lung cancer so please remember the fact please remember the fact prophylactic cranio radiation is given for small cell cancer the exact question has been replicated you can go through uh, this was a difficult one in fact uh, this question was discussed in the jipmar exam so i agree i mean this is is not not done i mean mci should not be putting up questions like these but then one or two like these should not affect your equilibrium you see most guys got uh, busted by those longer questions whereas those longer questions were always having a key point and these like these you know relatively smaller ones are the ones which are i personally i am personally scared of the smaller ones the longer ones i'm still able to solve maybe because i have a habit of seeing multiple findings in a question from a very young age like the way i was trained as a doctor you know we had to go through those long case based scenarios so that's the need of the hour okay moving to the next one a elderly gentleman fell in the bathroom in early morning hours and was rushed to the casualty and then he's talking about a low gcs and a ct head now most guys were very worried about the ct head finding definitely there's a midline shift present you can see that the cns bleed is contributing to displacement of the ventricles of the patient but you know guys even if you know this is black and this is white why this is black and white because the patient is having a, a, a rather i would say a hyper density initially but then some part of the blood would be reabsorbed also you see in this image which 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 i would say is not very particular uh, it can contribute to a difficulty in diagnosis but then look at this aspect which i have highlighted in the app whenever you read about elderly person falling in the bathroom what are you going to think about you're always going to think about subdural hemorrhage you know to solve this question on the basis of let me say radiological interpretation might be difficult for you but i can assure you the fact that if you ever read this person elderly person obese person parkinsonism patient alzheimer disease person falling in the bathroom the the impact of the head hitting the ground will contribute to subdural hemorrhage in a patient it will contribute to a concave or convex hyperdensity that's the kind of a concave or convex hyperdensity which is present in this particular case but i just want to highlight the fact that even if you can't pick it up or even if the image was not exactly like this guys there was a midline shift that much i know no my tnd batch guys are very brilliant chaps they told me regarding this fact sir midline shift tha aur banda gir gaya bathroom mein to diagnosis kya hoga subdural hemorrhage hoga तो सर जी इस क्वेश्चन को सॉल्व करने के लिए ना फर्स्ट लाइन से ही क्रैक हो जाता है क्वेश्चन सो लॉट ऑफ दिस क्वेश्चन आर हैविंग पॉइंटर्स दैट दैट इज व्हाट आई एम ट्राइंग टू टेल यू नो दस पॉइंटर्स आर द वंस व्हिच आर टू बी क्रैक्ड मूविंग टू द नेक्स्ट वन नाउ इवन द सर्जन विल टॉक अबाउट इट बट लेट मी जस्ट सॉल्व इट फॉर यू दिस टॉक्स अबाउट अ यंग वुमन हु ऑन कोल्ड टेम्परेचर और इमोशनल स्ट्रेस हैविंग दिस एपिसोड्स यू कैन सी द फिंगर कलर्स चेंजिंग फ्रॉम वाइट टू ब्लू टू रेड in the previous years in the exam they simply used to ask what does it indicate it indicates renaults phenomenon this time also he put up a question but rather than simply giving a image and saying comment on the diagnosis he put up a four liner history which is useless the moment i read it i know it's a renaults phenomenon now is it primary is it secondary the bottom line is that when it comes to primary it is idiopathic if it is secondary that means there should be some connective tissue disorder he has written here no there is no underlying there is no underlying illness there is no comorbidity in the patient if there is no underlying illness there is no comorbidity in the person it cannot be a secondary it would be a primary renaults phenomenon so answer to this question is alpha harlequin sign is guys what you see with the pediatrics and enham is a feature in bailey and love no in fact enham is a gangrene of the toes that is seen in negros right so this is anyway not gangrene this is renaults phenomenon so the answer to this question is alpha 
Coming to the flow volume curve, uh, I know a lot of you were very perplexed by this question. You can go through the medicine section of the app. You can go to pulmonology and see me discussing flow volume curves. I have discussed flow volume curves for obstructive lung disorder, restrictive lung disorder, intraparenchymal. I have talked about extrathoracic, intrathoracic obstruction. And bottom line was simple, sir. I will just quickly draw before you. Just keep your eyes on the board. Five seconds. जो फ्लो वॉल्यूम कर्व होता है उसमें द इंस्पिरेशन पार्ट इज इन्फीरियर एक्सपिरेशन पार्ट इज अबर्व आज दिस गाय टू ब्रीद इन देन आज दिस गाय टू ब्रीद आउट नाउ वट हैपन्स इन एस्तमा और सी ओ पी डी इज ब्रीदिंग इन इज ओके बट एस्तमा इज अ डिजीज ऑफ एक्सपिरेशन ना सो दिस एक्सपिरेटरी पार्ट विल बी कॉनकेव दिस पार्ट विल बी स्कैलोप दिस वुड बी अ कॉनकेविटी बिकॉज ऑफ प्रोलॉन्ग एक्सपिरेशन सीन इन ऑब्स्ट्रक्टिव एयरवे डिसऑर्डर सो वट यू कैन सी हेयर इज अ वेरी क्लासिकल फ्लो वॉल्यूम कर फॉर सी ओ पी डी वेन इट कम्स टू रिस्ट्रिक्टिव लॉन्ग डिसऑर्डर अगली बार दे देगा अगली बार रिस्ट्रिक्टिव लॉन्ग डिसऑर्डर देगा मैं ड्रॉ करके दिखाता हूँ रिस्ट्रिक्टिव लॉन्ग डिसऑर्डर कैसे दिखेगा इसको जस्ट फॉलो करना restrictive lung border the curve will start a little towards let me say this is left this is right so this will start slightly on the left you know the lung volumes will be reduced and then you will notice a beanie cap appearance this part will be very pointed in patients having interstitial lung disease there is a shift of the curve we will always give you a baseline curve jo dotted wala hai wo baseline curve hai so if you get a curve shift if the curve is given this is normal if it gives you a curve which is slightly towards shifted towards left it has a very pointed beanie cap appearance as compared to normal which is more more curved it will have a proper pointed beanie cap appearance in interstitial lung disease you want to listen to this more details of this you can go to the main section in the app where i discussed flow volume curve but this i think was a piece of cake guys you can very well see copd why it's the answer because there's a scalloping there's a concavity present move into the next question this was a lady presenting for a routine antenatal checkup which blood gas abnormalities expected to be present i mean you see guys a lot of guys were very worried sir it, they are mixing medicine with obgy man this is no mixing this is straight forward data you all know that in pregnancy the oxygen demand of the mother will go up so what will happen she will hyperventilate respiratory rate would be higher if there is a respiratory rate higher what will it cause carbon dioxide wash out and if there is a carbon dioxide wash out what will happen less production of protons you know you know this reaction right from your biology days not even i'm talking in medical school days you know this reaction right carbon dioxide water carbonic acid protons and bicarbonate so see what happens just look at this no carbon dioxide is becoming lesser so protons will also be lesser so there would be a alkalosis a lady having hyperventilation and having less protons because physiological finding of pregnancy is hyperventilation so this would be respiratory alkalosis developing in a patient this is discussed in the abg section you can go through the electrolytes component or i would suggest you to go through two lectures in the pgme section or uh, two must must know lectures if you're sitting for december 2020 fmg exam two lectures to be listened from the pgme section are abg simplified i have made it very simple very crisp and very very to the pro, uh, to the point there are two lectures on arterial blood gas analysis you would understand very basic data for it and i have just put a snapshot from there i have described respiratory alkalosis respiratory acidosis metabolic alkalosis and metabolic acidosis bottom line is hyperventilation causes carbon dioxide wash out less carbon dioxide causes less protons or so respiratory alkalosis in status asthmaticus there is a build up of carbon dioxide so there is a respiratory acidosis and there are various permutation combinations which can be remembered like if in the same mcq in 2020 december he says pregnant lady with hyperemesis gravidarum she is puking all the time then there would be metabolic alkalosis so just go through these abnormalities i mean they are i would say bread and butter for uh, any physician and that is why they put it up in the exam the next question is slightly integrated in a sense that it is with physiology you know he is talking about rabies virus the dog bit him on the arm but the virus will spread retrogradely to the spinal cord and then obviously to the brain so rabies virus is spreading to central nervous system it is spreading to the peripheral nervous system or even tetanus you know the toxin toxin goes to uh i would say the uh, peripheral nervous system causing rigidity so he is rather asking you that which molecular motor is used so all of you are aware of retrograde uh, uh, retrograde molecular motor and antigrade uh, molecular motor no in the axons the antigrade is kinesin and the retrograde is dynein so the answer to this is right before you but this was i think instead of just saying retrograde axonal transport as a physiologist would have taught you they decided to ask it in this particular fashion moving to the next question he talks about this car driver he is involved in an accident is brought to the er with breathlessness 
on physical examination he is having tachycardia with a low bp that's the cause of concern maybe he's bleeding inside body temperature is fine but extensive bruising is noticed on the chest and a bedside x-ray was performed and you can definitely see the fractures so you very well know that you're dealing with a case of flail chest so in earlier years in mci exam he simply used to ask you what is the best management of flail chest which is positive pressure ventilation but in this time he decided to give you a clinical history that's it but the moment you read about a car crash the moment you read about injuries to the chest the moment you see multiple fractures you know what are you going to do this guy will have hypoventilation hypoventilation will cause carbon dioxide accumulation in the body carbon dioxide accumulation will cause respiratory acidosis and acidosis can kill this man so if you want to keep this guy alive you need to kick out this carbon dioxide how would you kick out this carbon dioxide intubate this chap and then put him on positive pressure ventilation so the answer to this question is choice number c coming to the next question he talks about this lady with lung cancer having shortness of breath now lung cancer patients can be having pleural effusions and that can contribute to shortness of breath on examination her neck veins are engorged showing gross elevation of jvp the moment you read that you know that the cause is not a pleural effusion though i have not commented on the x ray at the moment the moment he is talking about jvp you know the fact that he is talking about a cardiac cause of breathlessness in this person so lung cancer patient having breathlessness but the problem is not stemming from the lung per se it's not the cancer which is per se causing a problem the cancer has caused something to the heart now let's read on he talks about distant heart sounds now where do you read distant heart sounds you read about distant heart sounds in back stride and back stride is always going to be a feature of cardiac tamponade the breath sounds appear reduced on the left side i mean that was the point that caused confusion in the minds of students because if breath sounds are reduced it could be pleural effusion also but my point is that there are two features which are talking about cardiac involvement rather three what are the three cardiac pointers towards or rather pointers towards cardiac involvement in this case elevated jugular venous pressure distant heart sounds and a significantly increased cardiothoracic ratio because what's happening in this case is fluid outside the heart you can see that i've described cardiac tamponade with a similar kind of an example there's fluid accumulation around the heart this guy of lung cancer is basically having a malignant pleural eff pericardial effusion he can be having a pleural effusion also no doubt about it but a ma malignant pericardial effusion is going to contribute to crushing of the heart you can see the pressure on the heart will contribute to the development of back stride and the moment you read about these aspects of uh, muffled heart sounds elevated jvp hypotension and back stride you are very well bang on spot discussing or knowing the fact that why in this person deterioration is occurring the correct answer to this question is cardiac tamponade congestive heart failure is uh, there is no risk factors for heart failure so i'm ruling that out bilateral pleural effusion i can see the cp angle so i'm ruling that out svc syndrome yes that could be a possibility but that in svc syndrome there must be a mass pressing on the heart svc syndrome is more common with lung cancer right i think that's a different mcq that you know small cell lung cancer causes a superior vena cava syndrome even that will cause a elevated jvp in the person but at this point of time the main keyword in this question is and that is what most of my students gave a feedback heart sounds are distant the moment you read that you know about the fact that this is going to be a rather a cardiac tamponade which is pressing on the heart from outside it's going to crush the heart it's going to exsanguinate the heart and therefore the manifestations of uh, uh, low blood pressure would develop and this can contribute to death also the type of shock developing in this patient is called as obstructive shock so you can see the snapshots from the app here for the same moving to the next one a elderly patient with malignancy has developed hematuria which is with a dipstick and urine sample is showing a 4 plus proteinuria which of the following is a possible diagnosis of the patient the bottom line is it's a elderly patient and there is a definite malignancy and there is features of uh, nephrotic range proteinuria so let's join the dots together a old man with nephrotic syndrome and is a known case of uh, malignancy also so which nephrotic syndrome is associated with malignancy the correct answer for that would be mgn membranous glomerulopathy you can see a snapshot from the app where i have highlighted that membranous glomerulopathy is associated with solid organ tumors or could be associated with lymphoma or could be associated with leukemia in fact the statement that i have highlighted in membranous glomerulopathy in the nephrotic syndrome part of the lecture is that nephrotic syndrome seen with cancer nephrotic syndrome seen in old age is mgn so instead of simply asking you what is the commonest variety of nephrotic syndrome in old age he decided to give you a old man with a known solid organ tumor and then say that there is a hematuria and a proteinuria and yes in patients who are having mgn it's a mixed picture 
it's a mixed picture you can have a nephrotic and a nephritic both presentations could be simultaneously present in a patient so the question was simply uh, i would say deliberately made a clinical in a sense that they put in two three lines otherwise they could have simply put old man nephrotic what is the cause instead of that they put it in a descriptive fashion but i think the question was straightforward the next question talks about this chap who's brought to the er with loss of consciousness following a road traffic accident maybe the surgeon would also like to talk about it the gcs is low person is in coma mri head is involved now which is the diagnosis subarachnoid hemorrhage you see subarachnoid hemorrhage will be showing presence of blood in the sylvian fissure where is the sylvian fissure sylvian fissure is here this would be separating the parietal from the temporal lobe now you cannot see any whiteness in the sylvian fissure of this person i repeat again where do you see subarachnoid hemorrhage you are supposed to see it in the sylvian fissure most of the time or you can see blood in this area that would be the fissure separating the uh, or this would be a anteriorly present fissure that would be separating the two frontal lobes so in this question subarachnoid hemorrhage is ruled out there is no subdural hemorrhage you can't see any concavo convexity you are left with cerebral amyloid angiopathy and diffuse axonal injury any time you are having a mri head with no gross findings visible but the person is still in coma road traffic accident head injury and no visible bleeding head injury patient in coma the bottom line is there is a road traffic accident the person is in coma and the mri of the person looks apparently normal i mean that's the point you know those some people pointed at some white spots which could be uh, incidental calcifications but mri that is not showing any gross bleed it's not edh it is not sdh it is not subarachnoid hemorrhage that would be diffuse axonal injury and cerebral amyloid angiopathy yaar ye to is a cause of brain hemorrhage na cerebral amyloid angiopathy old man mein milta hai i mean how would he put up a question of cerebral amyloid angiopathy you talk about a elderly patient non diabetic non hypertensive like a person was brought into a casualty today is a old man his son is saying sir my father is non diabetic non hypertensive but he still had a brain hemorrhage what is the cause the cause is in old age the brain blood vessels become weak why because there is amyloid deposition protein deposition in the blood vessels that makes it weak that is cerebral amyloid angiopathy so cwa cerebral amyloid angiopathy is the one that is encountered in old patients who are having no risk factors like diabetes and hypertension and still are having a brain hemorrhage the correct answer to this would be a diffuse axonal injury moving to a question that talks about uh, hv interval in a very peculiar tracing i mean you know the image that is given here can definitely cause jitters but this is from first year guys this is from genong this is actually not a question of internal medicine it's because integrated that is why i've discussed it here but i want to highlight before you that his bundle electrocardiogram was the one that was given and in his bundle electrocardiogram there are just three points to be remembered what has to be remembered p a a h and then hv intervals so let's do a quick recap i mean uh, p a a h and h v intervals what do they indicate we we'll, we are doing here a quick discussion so i'll just focus on h v interval h v interval ind indicates you know h stands for bundle of phase so it talks about conduction from bundle of phase to the subsequent bundle branches i'll put it like this the impulse will start from sn node travel to the av node it does not go through the av node no it goes across the two sides of the av node and then you have is a septal activation so what i'm saying is guys the moment the impulse hits the bundle of phase and then goes to the left fascicle and then goes to the right fascicle first to left and left to right this is responsible for the hv interval the impulse you know i'll just put markings here the septal activation occurring and the impulse going to the fascicle is which is responsible for the hv interval that is the question so uh, in the given tracing the hv interval basically do, do, denotes so it's anti-grade conduction anti-grade conduction from bundle of phase to perginje and anti-grade conduction from bundle of phase to bundle bundle branches you see this second uh, option which is a close between c and d why d is not the answer is because the spread of impulses to the perginje fiber is responsible for the qrs complexes but at the moment the current has not reached the the uh, the epicardial part of the of the muscle it is rather just starting from the bundle of phase and moving to the left and the right fascicle so that basically indicates a hv interval the correct answer to this option is uh, c and delta or option number d would indicate a rather a uh, rs complex uh, you can go through this through genong the physiologist will also talk about it but uh, Uh, if you just have a orientation for p a a h and h v i think you bang on spot to solve questions on his bundle electrocardiogram the next question has a anatomy slash medicine overlap 60 year old chap homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing the keyword is macular sparing now the moment you read that you know the answer right this would be occipital cortex so the bottom line of this discussion is to tell you why 
I mean, you can just go through the scores so that you can get a better idea regarding how well did you fare in the exam. Moving to the next one, a 60 year old man is presented with chronic projectile vomiting and significant weight loss. The moment you read that projectile vomiting, you know you're dealing with metabolic alkalosis. We have discussed this in the routine app section, metabolic alkalosis, how it develops in the person. There is hyperaldosteronism and hyperaldosteronism will cause urinary loss of potassium and hydrogen and if you have a urinary loss of potassium and hydrogen that will cause a metabolic alkalosis definitely because hydrogen is getting kicked out of the body. The point in this patient was, I'll go back to the options, everybody could pick up hypokalemic, hypochloremic, no issues. But because he's having fluid loss from the body, because this chap is having uh, uh, rather uh, rather uh, dehydration developing in his body, so there has to be a third electrolyte imbalance, that is sodium is also lesser. So there are three hypos in this chap, that is going to be hypokalemia, hypochloremia and a hyponatremia developing. And there's a fourth hypo also, which a lot of you did mention some of you did not mention so i did not include it but if you go through the section in the app i have explained metabolic alkalosis is associated with hypocalcemia now how that happens is uh, beyond the scope of this particular video you need to go to the main video for that but do remember the fact that metabolic alkalosis ke saath char hypos hote hain kon kon se char hypos hote hain potassium less hota hai chloride less hota hai sodium less hota hai aur calcium bhi less hota hai और इसमें तो यार उसने प्यूकिंग किया ना तो इज लूजिंग फ्लूड्स फ्रॉम द बॉडी एंड वेल व्हाट फ्लूड वुड यू गिव फॉर दिस चैप व्हाट इज द फ्लूड ऑफ चॉइस फॉर मेटाबॉलिक एल्कोलोसिस गाइस और यस नेक्स्ट टाइम ही कैन गिव यू अ क्वेश्चन लाइक दिस ही कैन डिस्क्राइब अ चैप हु इज हैविंग ऑल दीस इलेक्ट्रोलाइट इंबैलेंसेस लाइक दिस एंड ही माइट से व्हाट फ्लूड विल बी गिवन फॉर करेक्शन सो द फ्लूड फॉर करेक्शन फॉर मेटाबॉलिक एल्कोलोसिस इज नॉर्मल सलाइन फॉर मेटाबॉलिक एसिडोसिस यू नो इज रिंगर लैक्टेट बट द बॉटम लाइन इज देयर आर फोर हाइपोस व्हिच आर एसोसिएटेड विद मेटाबॉलिक एल्कोलोसिस सो प्लीज गो थ्रू दिस गाइस इलेक्ट्रोलाइट वाला जो पार्ट है ना इसको चाहे आप पीजीएमए से कर लो एंड फॉर दोस ऑफ यू हु आर आस्किंग मी शुड आई रीड एफएमजी शुड आई रीड पीजीएमए माय आंसर इज फर्स्ट गो थ्रू एफएमजी पार्ट यू नो you start a car from first gear go to second go to third gear you straight away can't start the car in third gear so seedha pgma karoge fayda nahi hoga but you start from the fmg segment do some topics from pgma segment what topic to be done for pgma segment electrolytes 2 ghante ka lecture hai i assure you the fact go through the first lecture of kidney section in pgma but pehle aapko kidney padhna hai fmg se so that you get the basics right uske baad mein step 2 hai go through the electrolyte section in the pgme part you know aap ek bar kar loge 50 hours of uh, uh, fmg part and then about 125 hours of pgme part mein sara to karne ke liye bol bhi nahi raha but do the fmg part thoroughly and then do selected topics from uh, the pgme part i think you are bang on spot man nothing will stop you the correct answer to this question is alpha we move to the next one uh this is the image i was talking about uh, a person of ulcerative colitis is having a ulcer on the leg you see they always ask you about extra intestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease whenever is going to be inflammatory bowel disease and there is going to be ulcer developing it's going to talk about pyoderma gangrenosum uh, you can go through the app section of inflammatory bowel disease and uh, i have described these manifestations in fact two images which i can say directly related to the images that are shown even in the rapid revision part is pretibial myxedema came and uh, pyoderma gangrenosum came moving ahead the surgeon would also like to talk about this question but i'll do my part the person is a tourist guide on mount everest you know uh, there was a discussion in the app on a question from you know summit of mount everest though this was a question related to blood gases but then even this contributes to the fact that why a person is sick because the higher you go up on mount everest option is lesser no and it's it's biting biting cold so there can be two possibilities one the guy will always be having respiratory alkalosis he would be having hypoxia and because of cold there would be frostbite i mean the moment you read about a question about a soldier posted on siachen glacier or a summit of mount everest what are you thinking about you are thinking about four things that is the thought process i want you to always have respiratory alkalosis hypoxia frostbite high altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema i mean those are the complications that are seen at high altitude in this question he described this chap who is a tourist guide on mount everest and when he came down there were multiple blisters on his foot so he is developed a frostbite he is described these blisters are excruciatingly painful there are erythematous changes it is tender to touch obviously 
he says which is not going to be useful so oxygen will definitely improve his mental status it will improve the oxygenation of the tissues i mean after all i need a better blood supply because there's a definitive vasoconstriction here so if i give oxygen to this chap it will definitely improve the local tissue perfusion so yes oxygen would be given aspirin well i want to cut down the inflammation part i want to cut down the pain component part so if i am at a peripheral hospital and i wanna i don't have uh, let me say tramadol i don't have access to fortwin finargan i don't have access to opioids for killing the pain at least i can give aspirin that will cut down the inflammation component and the pain component pentoxifilin guys what it does it it reduces the viscosity of blood and when i was discussing this in the zoom meeting with uh, my prep students a lot of those guys were saying ki sir uh, viscosity reduction is done by aspirin no aspirin man is anti platelet drug it is not a uh, agent that reduces viscosity wo to you know to tell a patient we say like this that aspirin blood ko patla karta aspirin blood ko patla nahi karta hai wo to anti platelet drug hai blood ko patla kon karta hai what drug reduces viscosity of blood that is pentoxifilin so what is the advantage if you reduce the viscosity of blood what will happen the perfusion to the distal tissues will improve and if the perfusion to the tissues will improve therefore the chances of gangrene this guy will reduce but there is no role of anti clotting drugs like warfarin in this chap so the correct answer to this question is c we move to the next one a person presented with back pain maybe the age of the person was given i got a feedback that this was again a geriatric age group person with back pain now old man presents with back pain na to kya sochna kya hai disc prolapse uske baad kya sochna hai metastasis from any cancer and in if it's a male the metastasis will usually be from a prostate cancer and if it's a female the metastasis will usually be from breast cancer and if these are not in the options then the next cause to be thought of of severe backache in any person of geriatric age group is multiple myeloma you go through the mci questions of previous years whenever he is talking about this statement no old man with back pain old man with back pain it's always always going to be four differential diagnoses either it could be disc prolapse due to faulty sitting habits either it's a metastasis or it's a multiple myeloma and then you can see punched out lesions so no so he is telling you it's multiple myeloma because the uh, punched out lesions and he's saying what test would be done in this chap so i can show you a snapshot from the app when i have discussed multiple myeloma the highlight screening test is electrophoresis we can either do a serum or a urinary electrophoresis in the patient that will show a monoclonal component or a m spike the correct answer to this question is delta and do remember the differentials for low back ache in old age going to the next question he talks about this aids positive chap i mean repeated question of mci you know aids positive truck driver with cryptococcal meningitis earlier he was just saying aids positive person with fever headache nuchal rigidity differential diagnosis number 1 is cryptococcal meningitis this times he himself told it is cryptococcal meningitis what is the rapid test now bottom line is guys a lot of you answered india inc you see india inc may it's a negative stain it's not staining the organism it is staining the capsule right or it is staining the uh, the organism per se is not highlighted no even dust particles can look like cryptococcal uh, neoformins so india inc is one not a rapid test second it is dependent on the skill of the microbiologist mess up you see i uh, you uh, if i put it like this what is rapid test for covid we need to go for antigen test no or antibody based test because pcr will take a long time a report will take time to come so a uh, antigen or antibody test has to be a, a rapid test so i'm ruling out india inc from the discussion now i'm ruling out blood culture and csf culture that is ruled out in the actual lecture maine aapko kya bataya csf elisa for cryptococcal antigen na so ab usne csf elisa nahi di option mein to kya fark padta hai to blood mein kar lenge na lateral flow assay for cryptococcal antigen but the bottom line is we jo bhi rapid test hota hai i mean the bottom line is for any rapid test it has to be antigen or antibody based test so you just have to look for this option that is it mentioning antigen yes the best test for diagnosis of cryptococcal meningitis if you ask me and is given in the textbook is csf elisa for cryptococcal antigen it is written as crag c r a g c r bada a g chota cryptococcal c r a g antigen to bottom line yahi hai ki isko elisa se kar lo isko latest agglutination se kar lo ya isko lateral flow assay se kar lo jo methods hai wo microbiologist se aap pad sakte ho ki bhai alag alag differences kya hai for me as a clinician the antigen test or antibody test is a rapid test so that would help me in diagnosis of this chap and anyway i mean cryptococcal meningitis extensively asked we will treat this chap with amphobi the next question talks about this chap who works in a glass factory a pathology with medicine 
guy works in a glass factory so i am talking about silicosis right and this guy is having progressive shortness of breath he is predisposed to development of which of the following so thank god he did not make this question longer and start giving you features of tb but i think all of you are aware of this fact that silicotics have a predisposition to development of tuberculosis silicotics would be having interstitial lung disease and then the possibility of tb is increased in these patients because the security system is busy fighting that silica dust the next question talks about this girl who has developed acute itp is managed with steroids you very well know that in acute itp we have to give steroids there is a recurrence of low platelet count once the steroids were stopped and that's a very common finding because this is a autoimmune disorder the moment you stop the steroids there might be a small dip now you need to know are there any visible findings of recurrence of bleeding is she having gum bleeds is she having petechiae the question mentioned that in current physical examination there is no petechiae or any physical evidence of bleeding that tells you the fact that platelet count is low but is not life threatening guys life threatening platelet count life threatening platelet count is when the values go to less than 10000 in this question there is no mention of any platelet count given but there is no visible bleeding no the question says what is the next line of treatment lot of guys answered splenectomy no guys splenectomy is answered when there is a low platelet count with evidence of bleeding but in this case acute itp in children has a good prognosis there is a self resolution in most of the cases this is just a natural course history if you listen to the itp discussion the bottom line is that in acute itp in children you will always have a good prognosis adults might be having still remissions for patients of chronic itp we go in for splenectomy for chronic itp we go in for splenectomy but in acute itp if a person is having low platelet counts with no evidence of bleeding there is no need to worry especially in children because if the platelet count is let me say 80000 let me make it lower 40000 20000 still i'm not worried why because life threatening sinus bleeds are usually seen below less than 10000 so in this case we will not continue with steroids because anyway we have discontinued steroids in the patient so a is ruled out splenectomy is treatment for chronic itp as i said this is a case of acute itp so this would be answered as wait and a watch with self resolution as occurs in most cases of acute itp and uh, well if you can go through the hindi section of uh, itp part there i have described the role of rho immunoglobulin you know i've talked about intravenous immunoglobulin then i've talked about rho immunoglobulin because traditionally we read about rho immunoglobulin for uh, a lady who has uh, who's rh negative you know in obgy you read about rho immunoglobulin so for more details of itp go to the english section and listen to the itp part and uh, usually when they ask you questions in uh, hematology nowadays one blood cancer all is asked or aml or cml or cll i mean blood cancer and then in platelets they love to ask about itp because that's the usual presentation that is seen coming to the next question this is pediatric slash medicine what is the primary defect in vitamin d resistant rickets so we are talking about fh vr r r r here familial hypophosphatemic vitamin d resistant rickets there is a defective gene here which is called as fex gene now the problem with this fex gene is that it causes a rather overactivity of this molecule that is fgf23 and fgf23 what it causes is phosphate wasting a phosphate wasting se kya hoga jo bone hai बोन की जो स्ट्रेंथ है ना वो कैल्शियम अलून पे डिपेंडेंट नहीं होती है बोन की जो स्ट्रेंथ होती है वो कैल्शियम हाइड्रोक्सी एपाटाइट और मल्टीपल अदर सॉल्ट्स पे डिपेंडेंट होती है सो इट्स नॉट ओनली कैल्शियम दैट गिव्स बोन स्ट्रेंथ इट इज मल्टीपल अदर सॉल्ट्स दैट गिव बोन स्ट्रेंथ और फॉस्फेट वेस्टिंग हो जाती है तो कैल्शियम हाइड्रोक्सी एपाटाइट की फॉर्मेशन लेसर हो जाती है आई विल मेक इट सिंपलर वट आई एम बेसिकली टेलिंग यू इज दैट इन रेजिस्टेंट रेकेट्स दिस अ डिफेक्टिव जीन दैट यू ऑलो देर इज ओवर एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ अ हॉर्मोन विच इज एंटागनिस्ट ऑफ पी टी एच राइट पी टी एच क्या करता है पी टी एच एंड FGF23 they have slightly different actions from each other in simple words i can put it like this that the major action of FGF23 is phosphate being kicked out and when phosphate is kicked out then calcium hydroxy appetite is relatively lesser and the bone becomes relatively weaker and that is where the deformities would come uh, like let me say knock knees would come up in the patient or there could be bow legs occurring in the patient so the bottom line is in resistant rickets there is defective uh, uh, defective fex gene that contributes to phosphate wasting from the proximal renal tubules coming to alcoholics they love to ask about alcoholics in mca exam this is one again such a demonstration 30 year old alcoholic he had a drink 48 hours ago 
he has currently developed anger rage attack so is becoming violent he is unable to identify faces of family members and he can see inanimate objects inanimate objects mean non non living he can see rock he can see chair he can see any object which is non existent he has been brought to your er what is your diagnosis now the bottom line is he stopped drinking 2 days ago and alcohol withdrawal will contribute usually to delirium tremens the correct answer to this is alpha though the psychiatrist may be also giving inputs regarding it but the bottom line is uh, why is it not alcoholic hallucinosis is because alcoholic hallucinosis will mainly be having auditory hallucinations and additional features which are given like violence rage attacks are usually not given in alcoholic hallucinosis in korsakov psychosis we have confabulation he becomes a pathological liar there is no confabulation no antigrad amnesia given here in wernicke's encephalopathy you anyway know the mnemonic goa that is global confusion of thalmoplegia and aereflexia so because none of those features are given in the question our answer is dt and for this chap what would you do you would be loading this guy with iv lorazepam you would be giving iv thymine to this person and that would definitely help in a quick recovery of this chap if you are managing him properly the answer to this question is alpha moving to the next one this is a person who's having loose stools 18 times with reduced urine frequency what will be the correct finding of the person you see if a person is having loose stools with reduced urine frequency it means that the person can go into pre renal variety of acute kidney injury now the moment you go into pre renal variety of acute kidney injury the body will try to conserve fluid and there would be a concentration of urine if you look at option a urinary sodium more than 40 this is a feature of salt wasting you know if sodium is more in the urine it means salt wasting and salt wasting is a feature of damage to the tubular part of the kidney when your tubular part of damage to the kidney it means renal type of renal injury i repeat that statement again option number a is ruled out why because of the fact that urinary sodium more than 40 is a feature of renal variety of renal failure like glomerulonephritis but this chap is having pre renal variety because blood supply to kidney is lesser option number b is kidney biopsy showing glomerular damage we don't do a kidney biopsy in a acute kidney injury patient there is no rule of kidney biopsy in a chap with the aki post renal is ruled out because post renal is seen with conditions like benign prostatic hyperplasia or let me say vesico ureteric reflux or i can say bladder outlet obstruction so post renal azotemia is ruled out because this dehydration component is actually a feature of the a uh, pre renal aki in fact i can show you a image here or from the app which will make it more clear i one i have highlighted hypovolemia as a trigger for pre renal aki and second i have done a test to demonstrate whether it is pre renal or renal and what is the test on urinary sodium if tubules are damaged salt will not be absorbed no if tubules are damaged salt will not be absorbed so high urinary salt will be present that is why urinary sodium will be increase or more than 40 whereas urinary sodium would be reduced in pre renal variety because the body will try to get back all the salt to conserve the volume so whenever it's a pre renal variety you have a decreased urinary sodium when you have a renal variety you have a high urinary sodium which rules out option number a which a lot of you were confused i would suggest you to go through acute kidney injury topic aki just go through the stages because there was a pediatric question that i'll discuss subsequently on acute kidney injury in this exam so two questions on aki came one is regarding the variety and second was regarding the staging so i'll i'll discuss about the uh, the staging part subsequently but i want you to know regarding the etiology of acute kidney injury and how it manifests in the person the correct answer to this question would be choice number c that would be hyperosmolar urine coming to the next question this talks about a 50 year old lady with hypertension admitted with breathlessness in supine position so he's talking about orthopnea and simultaneously this person is having palpitation so we are definitely thinking in terms of a pulmonary edema component of heart failure in this person Uh, there are congested neck veins there is a hepatomegaly and then you can see a fitting edema present so that's a straightforward one they simply wanted you to pick up features of congestive heart failure and uh, chf uh, examination wise is pretty straightforward as i have discussed in the app treatment part yeah i definitely wanted to study and i have highlighted that for uh, management of patients of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and that was a question this time which drug will reduce mortality it will be aldosterone antagonists the second drug that will reduce mortality would be arni and if he talks about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction even then the first answer would be arni in the patient so do remember about this 
and then the agent that lowers mortality like mi patient has been discharged and he has been diagnosed with hypertension so even then the agent that will reduce mortality will be beta blocker that would be metoprolol in the patient so do remember these drugs that i have highlighted and uh, i think this question was relatively a easier one the next question has a overlap with pediatrics let's uh, try to solve it this boy has presented with multiple episodes of vomiting of blood on examination vitals are stable that's good news so you don't need to go for any volume resuscitation splenomegaly is no test so this tells you the fact that this person is definitely having a, a feature uh, something in the range of portal hypertension why i'm saying portal hypertension is because in a in a question which is talking about vomiting of blood and splenomegaly the link is portal hypertension because only then the esophageal veins will get congested you see portal vein pressure you know 5 to 10 millimeters why will it increase if there is a if there is a portal hypertension only then uh, the manifestations of vomiting of blood can occur because there would be portosystemic collaterals and the esophageal veins will also become congested and they'll pop off and boom they burst and the person starts vomiting blood now the mother is giving a very interesting history she says at birth the baby had jaundice and exchange transfusion was done and how do you do exchange transfusion exchange transfusion is done via the umbilical vein catheterization and umbilical vein joins which vein portal vein so what i'm saying is because this baby when this child five year old boy when this child was a newborn baby then because he underwent exchange transfusion and umbilical vein catheterization so it can result in a thrombus formation and the thrombus formation gradually will obstruct the portal vein so this patient is actually having a portal vein thrombosis there's a collateral circulation which is ensuring blood supply to the heart but ultimately this presentation is that of portal vein thrombosis which has resulted in portal hypertension now bud cherry syndrome always presents with the painful hepatomegaly bud cherry has been discussed in the liver section in the app you can go through that uh, sinusoidal fibrosis is alcoholic fibrosis now child would not be obviously consuming alcohol so you can rule that out non serotic portal fibrosis is our diagnosis of exclusion this is the rarest cause of uh, uh, portal hypertension if you go through the discussion i mean if a person is non-alcoholic or viral markers are negative the rare cause of portal hypertension is ncpf the correct answer to this question is portal vein fibrosis causes of portal hypertension have to be started and you can go through the cirrhosis and its complication lecture and portal hypertension discussion to understand this better the key of this mcq was that the child had undergone a procedure where umbilical vein catheterization was done and therefore uh, the catheter is a foreign body in the vein so that can trigger a thrombus formation the next question talks about this child 12 kgs the urine output is only 0.5 ml per kg per hour for 12 hours and the serum creatinine is showing a doubling what is the stage of aka by kdgo criteria my request to you would be to kindly go through the app in the acute kidney injury section there are three stages please don't mix with ckd in ckd it is gfr no 90 then 60 to 89 then 30 to 59 then 50 to 29 then less than 15 so we are not talking about ckd we're talking about akie and how to remember it you know ckd stage 2 is where there's doubling of serum creatinine ck uh, akie stage 2 is where there's doubling of serum creatinine akie stage 3 is where there's three times tripling of creatinine normal urine output is how much one ml per kg per hour if it decreases to 0.5 ml per kg per hour for six hours then it is going to be stage one if you are having for 12 hours then you call it stage two and if it's 0.3 see three coming up again and again you know, three times 0.3 and for 24 hours it is stage 3 so go through the aki section where i have discussed it and uh, well in this question you can very well work out the urine output is half of normal 1 ml per kg per hour is normal this is 0.5 ml per kg per hour for last 12 hours with doubling of serum creatinine so you can see from the table that the correct diagnosis of this person would be a stage 2 of aka and anyway for ckd guys it is not a stage no in ckd it is grading in chronic kidney disease we basically have is a grading and in acute kidney injury what we have is a staging so if you can go through this table it's simple 6 12 24 0 0.5 0 0.5 0 0.3 and 1.5 2 and 3 just get the numbers right now i mean right now if you just try to get a mental image of this now you can work out this question moving to the next one i mean this question has been distorted a lot guys this question is talking about a girl with honey crust lesions on the face which was diagnosed by the pediatrician as impetigo so he's already told you impetigo or even if you did not write the word impetigo honey crust lesions is impetigo she has now been brought with facial puffiness and is not eating well so there were two questions one was a pediatric question of echodermatitis enterohepatica right this question is having a girl who's having impetigo and impetigo is caused by streptococcus no 
it is caused by streptococcus and once streptococcus will contribute to this then there could be post streptococcal involvement that is post streptococcal glomerulonephritis because this girl will be having rbc's in the urine and how did i know that it is rbc's in the urine because she is having facial puffiness she is not eating well so what are the reasons for why a person would be having swelling on the face either the heart is swelling or the liver is not working or the kidneys are not working when any person comes to you with puffy face either it could be allergic reaction to food nothing like that given it it could be heart failing no heart failure findings it could be liver failing because albumin will become lesser so there could be puffiness if if uh, there is no heart issues there are no liver issues it has to be the kidney so this patient is actually having post streptococcal glomerulonephritis which will contribute to hematuria so pretty straightforward one this is a classic case of psgn guys you can go through the app section and describe this very thoroughly you can see impetigo will present after 2 weeks and that was the history that this girl has been brought after 2 weeks she has not been feeling well initially after impetigo uh, episode and uh, there is a hematuria manifestation so the clinical presentation is that of psgn coming to the next one uh, has a physiology overlap uh, the question talks about a person who is having microalbuminuria the question said what is the site of reabsorption of proteins now most guys mark that as podocytes see guys podocytes are for regulation they stop proteins here he is not talking about what will stop the proteins he is talking about what will reabsorb the proteins in the ultra filtrate so the answer for this would be proximal convoluted tubule so please remember podocytes are stopping proteins not reabsorbing the proteins what is going to reabsorb the proteins it is pct it is proximal convoluted tubule the correct answer to this is beta these are couple of questions that i have gathered at the moment and i have just discussed with you uh, there are more detailed discussions that would be following up in the app and also on our youtube channel so continue listening and uh, guys uh, as far as the paper is concerned i agree it's a difficult one but then we have to uh, you know taking it on the chin as they say in cricket i mean if somebody bowls a bouncer to me i will not uh, chicken out and say that oh you bowled me a bouncer i'll hit him for six i mean a guy sitting here can relate to me better you know all of you have played cricket if somebody tries to be aggressive with you what will you do either answer with aggression or back out so here what i'm saying is mentally be aggressive uh, focus on uh, the uh, parts which i have highlighted before and i'm very very sure that uh, as you keep on learning uh, it becomes a habit I, I i began the discussion by saying knowledge is power i'm ending by saying knowledge is power guys i mean it's all about what you have here no the gray matter that's what people are going to respect you for so uh, keep hammering keep putting in all your efforts and uh, i'll definitely see you on the other side that is the side of victory thank you so much for hearing me out Thank you.